Welcome, everyone. My name is Rebecca Tabor. I am the State Coordinator for Connecticut History Day, and I'm really excited that today we are starting a very new program to highlight some of the wonderful resources that you can use in researching your History Day project. I'm really pleased today to welcome my colleague, Sarah Morin, to, who is the project manager of the Uncovering New Haven project. And she's going to talk with us a little bit about this wonderful project and how you can access resources. Sarah, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. So everyone, welcome to the Uncovering New Haven Research Resources Online Forum for November 2023. I uh, just wanted to mention, just for a little bit of fun, uh, we have a couple of unofficial mascots here, Jelly Bean the Cat and Cluckers the Chicken, who will be appearing on some of the slides. So just a little about me. Um, I am the project archivist, as Rebecca said, for Uncovering New Haven. I started in this position in December 2020. I have done previous archival projects at the Connecticut State Library, at the University of Connecticut Archives, and a few historical societies in Massachusetts. And in my previous career, before I came in, became an archivist, I spent 15 years working in donor relations for various colleges and universities, including the University of Connecticut and Iona College. I have my MS in Library and Information Science and my BA in Professional and Technical Writing. So now just a little bit about the Uncovering New Haven project. Uh, the goal of this project is to preserve and to enhance public access to the New Haven County Court records. Now, most of these records, they date from 1700 to 1855. However, we do have some that date all the way back to 1666 and some that are as early or as, as uh, recent as the early 1900s. And one of the big components of our project is we want to identify and digitize court cases that involve BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, persons, and groups. So anywhere that anyone has interacted with the court system, we want to document that and put that information out there. And part, as part of this effort, that's involving creating an online index of BIPOC cases that people can view and search on our website. And we also want to scan BIPOC and other selected cases of research interests, like cases about women and uh, prominent people like Benedict Arnold, other interesting things we find that people will be interested in. These will all be scanned and put on the Connecticut Digital Archive, which is available for free without subscription. And one of the things too, I also wanted to mention is that this project is generously funded by the NHPRC, that's the National Historical Publications and Records Commission. They are the funding arm of the National Archives. And now the Connecticut State Library is funding it as we are extending the project. So one of the things I wanted to also talk about, because this is a big issue that a lot of people could use assistance in navigating with, and we keep in mind, we're also learning as well as we go along. Um, we are talking about people in the records and the terms that were used um, in previous eras were the polite terms for then, like for example, Indian, but that we do not use today for many reasons. So this is how we are talking about the records as we're writing about them, as we're presenting about them. For people of African heritage, we are describing them as African descended, African American, and Black, and it depends on the context. Like, for example, if we're talking about a court case from the early 1700s, America has not been established yet, so we would say African descended. Um, for Indigenous peoples, uh, we try to use the tribal name where available. Unfortunately, the court clerks did not prioritize recording this information. So they would often say so-and-so is an Indian of Milford. Um, but what we will do is we will try, if they mention, there are a few cases where they do mention the tribe. So we will mention that. We will also use Indigenous. Sometimes we will use Native American. And sometimes we will use if we are talking about legislation or specific programs, the old term Indian is still in use. We also try to prioritize if someone self-identifies, we try to prioritize that. In terms of discussing slavery, which was practiced in Connecticut, it was not fully banned until 1848. Um, what we do is when we are talking about specific people, um, we are trying to get away from the sort of master-slave uh, dialogue and 
and people who are enslaved, we call we say enslaved. The person who enslaves them is an enslaver. Other terms that can be used are captive or captor. Now for the institutions themselves, um, we are still using slavery and slave trade. But if there is a reason we need to use the outdated terms, we put them in quotes. So we try to basically what we're trying to do is to just trying to be sensitive and conscientious about the language we're using. Um, I do have a handout um, of places that we have a full our full policy document on how we're talking about different groups and things. It's on our website. It's also on the handout that I'm going to be providing along with this presentation. Um, and there are also other great resources that are on our subject guide that I will talk about later, where if people are looking for, you know, oh, what's the right term that I should be using to talk about this? Or what are old fashioned terms that we need to use for search purposes? Because this is what they would have been called back then. So before I delve into uh, the, the records themselves, just a really brief history of Colonial New Haven. It was founded as its own colony. 1638 by a group of English Puritans that were led by Reverend John Davenport and Theophilus Eaton. And according to American historian Perry Miller, New Haven was the essence of Puritanism, distilled and undefiled, the Bible Commonwealth, and nothing else. However, because New Haven sheltered regicidal judges who fled England after condemning King Charles I to death, King Charles II, when he was restored to the English throne, he merged them with Connecticut Colony in 1664. So, at this point, you might be asking yourself, why court records? Why, why do we look at them? Why are they important for research purposes? Well, one of the main reasons is people from all rungs of society appeared in court. So it wasn't just the wealthy appearing in court. You had people all rungs, all ancestries, all genders appearing in court. Um, and in fact, a court case may be the only place where there's a documented record of someone's existence, especially if they were poor or marginalized. And court cases themselves can provide a lot of information about people in their lives. For example, debt cases. There's a lot of debt cases. So you can see kind of what people's financial situations were. Um, there's land disputes. So you can kind of see where property boundaries are. Um, and then also, as I mentioned regarding chattel slavery, that was the form of slavery practiced where enslaved people were literally property. So you will see them listed in things like estate inventories and in lists of debts. So it's a really good way to trace people of African ancestry is through these records, such as so court cases, wills, probate records, they're, and they're more likely to provide actual names of African American, Black, and Indigenous people um, as, as, as compared to other records. So what kinds of documents might we find in a court case? Um, well, most commonly, you're going to find a writ, which is a summons to trial. It's a formal summons that somebody must appear in court to answer to so-and-so who's launching a lawsuit. Um, if it's a debt case, you're going to find things like promissory notes, bonds, lists of debts. You might find, if you're lucky, summaries of court proceedings. Like, you might find a little summary of, like, what happened in the, in the trial. Um, you might also find if there are depositions with other witnesses, testimony, um, testimony from them. Um, if there is a lawyer um, present, there will be pleadings, maybe someone designated someone as their power of attorney, you might see that. Um, you account lists of court costs, so like what it costs to appear in court, travel, other costs. If witnesses are summoned, um, you'll see those summons. And then if we're really lucky, we might get a jury verdict so we can see what happened in the case. Um, you won't necessarily find all these documents in every case, um, but you will find at least usually there's a rate and a list of costs. So these are like all the things you could potentially find. So now I'm going to talk about some very fun and interesting cases that I have found um, in the court records in my own processing and research. Um, there are a lot, especially at the county court level, I just want to give the caveat, there's a lot of debt, a lot of property disputes, but you're going to find some interesting things and as well as unusual things you may not expect. Like for example, when witchcraft in history is mentioned, what does everyone think of? They think of the Salem witch trials in 1692. And in Connecticut, the last known witchcraft prosecution was in 1697. The last known executions for witchcraft were in 1662-63. But this case, where it says, was a witch at the top, this was from 1742. 
and it is not a person being prosecuted. It is a slander case that's being filed by the accused. So you have this widow. Her name is Elizabeth Gould. She was an elderly widow who lived in the North Parish of Guilford. She sued fellow townsperson Benjamin Chittenden for slandering her as a witch. Now, women and men sued for slander commonly back then. Um, women tended to sue for slander that damaged their reputations because women were entirely dependent on their families, neighbors, and social networks. Uh, slander wasn't just emotionally devastating. It was a very real and tangible danger to their survival. And Chittenden had accused her. He said he didn't believe she was a witch and had a reason to believe it because she wrote down here to his house. Came in and got upon my breast, lay upon me so hard as to make the blood fly out at my mouth and nose. So now I want to talk about some of the fun things I've found in the New Haven County Court records. And I do want to offer the caveat, there are a lot of debt cases, a lot of property dispute cases, which are interesting in their own right, but they're sort of the more common types of cases you're going to find. Um, but there are also some very interesting nuggets of things that are unusual you and things you may not expect um so i want to kind of go through some of through these things that i have found um so this one was a witch when witchcraft history is mentioned many people just think of the salem witch trials which took place in massachusetts in 1692 and in connecticut the last known witchcraft prosecution was in 1697 and the last known executions for witchcraft were in 1662-63 However, this case is from 1742, and it is not a prosecution of an accused witch. It is a slander case that was filed by the woman who was accused of being a witch. And her name was Elizabeth Gould. She was an elderly widow who lived in the North Parish of Guilford. She sued fellow townsperson Benjamin Chittenden for slandering her as a witch. And slander cases were quite common back then. Men and women sued for slander a lot. For, for someone, women tended to sue for slander that damaged their reputations because they were entirely dependent on their families, neighbors, and social networks. So slander wasn't just emotionally devastating. It was a tangible and real danger to their survival. And Chittenden's accusation was quite colorful. Um, an excerpt from the case, he did believe she was a witch and had a reason to believe it because she rode down here to his house and came in and got upon my breast, lay upon me so hard as to make the blood fly out at my mouth and nose. And Gould countered that the reason he said these things is because he was jealous of her happy state, uh, her happy estate. And she was a quite comfortable widow uh, financially, so that could definitely have played a part. Um, unfortunately, his accusations had brought her into disgrace, contempt, and abhorrence with her neighbors. So she asked for 500 pounds in damages. Unfortunately, she did not receive it because the court found her declaration insufficient, meaning that it did not meet the burden of proof. And she had to pay Chittenden's court costs. Um, she did appeal, but she died a few years later. So very sad case, um, but very interesting because it sheds a lot of light on how the belief in witchcraft didn't just go away after Salem, although women didn't tend to be prosecuted for it, women and men. Although if this happened in 1642, she probably would have been in more danger. So this one just speaks for itself. This one is, this was the first piece of evidence I found involving Benedict Arnold. So what I didn't know about Benedict Arnold, I mean, everybody knows who Benedict Arnold is, but it's not as well known. He was a pharmacist and a bookseller in New Haven in the 1760s. So he lived in New Haven for a, quite a bit until he left for the Revolutionary War. And during that time, as many men, you know, did, they got involved in a lot of debt cases, especially if they were traders or doing or involved in any kind of business. Um, and he was in at least 70 cases him or his family member, like his sister Hannah, also had some debt cases in there. And sometimes he was the, the plaintiff, sometimes he was the defendant. And I picture this case because this was the very first one I found and I was thrilled <laughs> because I wasn't expecting it. Uh, and according, this is a promissory note um, and it was signed by Benedict Arnold. Uh, according to this note, he owes 19 pounds, 17 shillings and one penny farthing on demand with interest until paid to one Dr. David Atwater. So that was really cool finding this. 
now I want to talk about some interesting cases have found involving Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the records. So we have Phyllis and Sabina. Um, the case on the left, um, that is the first case we discovered with an African-American plaintiff. Um, her name was Phyllis. And a lot of times you'll notice that until the Revolutionary War afterward, um, people of color did not generally have surnames. They would they started picking surnames later, but right now uh, these women in the court records they do not have any surnames. Um, and until this case, until Phyllis's case, where she's a plaintiff, um, usually black people, African American people, African descended people they were subjects of cases because a lot of times there was usually disputes between enslavers. Um, or they were defendants because they owed a debt or had committed theft or another crime or something like that. So in 1765, Phyllis is a free woman from New Haven. She sued John Clark of Colchester for assault and false imprisonment. He was most likely trying to enslave her. She asked for 200 pounds in damages, which was quite a lot of money. Because Clark failed to show up to trial, the court awarded her full damages plus her court costs. So this was one of the nicer instances of justice that I've seen in the courts. So this next case, before I give an outline of what it was, I have to explain paper wasn't as plentiful in those days. So it was common for court clerks to use the backs of other documents for making records and notes and things. So we found this advertisement on the back of an evidence summons for an unconnected trespass case. Um, it is an advertisement it's from 1750 and it requests the return of Sabina. She was 20 years old, an indigenous woman, presumably enslaved or bound in servitude. Her she had escaped her captor, George Gorham of Stratford, and he offered five pounds for her recapture. Unfortunately, because this was just an advertisement we found on the back, we don't know what happened to Sabina. And to date, we haven't found any other available records, though we're definitely keeping our eye out just to see if we can find anything. So here's another interesting case we came across. Um, this was from 1716, so one of our earlier cases. Um, Micah Palmer of Bradford, he sued Mahitable Whitehead. Oh, it was not Branford, not Bradford. He claimed she falsely accused him of abusing his role as administrator of an estate. Um, so this was another slander case. Um, he said that she said that he had committed such underhanded cheating tricks and had many times feathered his nest with such tricks. So not only did Mahitable, she did not bag down, she issued a written rebuttal picture here to the court, um, requesting that the charges are dismissed because she argued he did wittingly and willingly cheat her and feather his nest with the money. And the reason that this written rebuttal is amazing because historians estimate that female literacy rates in the 1700s were only around 40 to 45% as compared to 80% for men. Um, and then in this case, not only did she win the case, uh, Palmer had to pay her court costs. So that was another interesting outcome. And another unexpected thing that I did not know before I started delving into these records is that um, some women were attorneys for their husbands in the early 1700s, um, which was especially interesting because married women couldn't represent themselves in court. Their husbands were legally answerable for them. And this principle was called coverture. If you were a single woman over 18, if you were a widow, um, you were allowed to conduct lawsuits on your own, but around 95% of colonial women married at least once in their lifetimes, so the majority of them fell under coverture. However, wives were expected to serve as competent and capable help meets, so they would, they would carry out the wishes of their husbands in business matters and in court, and they also tended to serve as the executors of their husbands' estates in the 1600s. And up until the mid 1700s, when you started to see a shift where more male relatives were designated and some women, again, were literate enough to serve as their husband's attorneys. Um, this is a case from the 1710s. Anna Guy of Branford, her husband, John, highly prolific debt plaintiff. He sued a lot of people for money. Um, she served as a, his attorney in five of his 31 cases at the time. And now we come to a more interesting and colorful part of the records, crimes of sin. So we have, these were prosecuted in colonial Connecticut under Rex. This is a formal Latin title for the King of England because Connecticut was answerable to the crown at the time. Now, if there was a ruling queen, um, it would be under Regina. Um, after the revolution, these kinds of crimes were prosecuted by the state of Connecticut. And some of these offenses we would not prosecute today, 
um, but others we still would. Um, so for example, one of the cases pictured here, the one on the far left, um, this one would still be prosecuted today. Um, this was a complaint from 1772. There was a man named John Leach of New Haven. Apparently he was attempting to drug certain young unmarried ladies in said New Haven with Spanish flies in order to seduce them. Um, so that would definitely still be prosecuted today. These other two cases um, involve um, fornication and, prof and uh, profaning the Sabbath, which we would not prosecute today. Um, the thing to know is that fornication prosecutions were very common in the court records, um, second after debt in the early 1700s. Not even married couples were immune to such charges because the authorities kept careful notes of how soon full-term babies appeared after weddings. And on the far right, we have a complaint from 1745. Um, Aaron and Elizabeth Morris delivered, quote, a perfect child only six and a half months after they were married. Now, the punishment for this offense was either whipping or paying a fine. Whipping was more common in the 1600s, but fines became the norm in the 1700s. And these kinds of prosecutions started to lessen as the 1800s approached. Um, so fewer and fewer people were being prosecuted. And then the case in the middle, profaning the Sabbath as well as other holy days of obligation. So in addition to Sundays, Puritans were often required to attend a lecture by their minister, minister generally on Thursdays. This was known as lecture day. And then in 1714, you have Abel Hol Holbrook of Derby. He was prosecuted for violating the sanctity of lecture day. The complaint stated he did contrary to the law sometime about the 10th of March, last passed upon a lecture day at night, entertained several persons at his house unseasonably. Another interesting thing to note in the court records is that Connecticut in the colonial times had some of the most liberal divorce laws in the Western world at the time um, because Puritans did not consider marriage a sacrament but a civil contract. However, it was still harder to get a divorce back then because no fault divorce didn't exist. You had to have grounds. And in the 1700s, grounds were desertion, adultery, bigamy, and fraudulent contract. And you could try for cruelty, but that as a grounds alone was not allowed until the late 1700s. Um, and I just wanted to show the one of the most unique and colorful divorce cases I've found to date. And these were handled at the superior court level because you needed an act from the General Assembly. Um, so you have Obadiah Munson versus Rachel Munson in 1778. So this happened during the Revolutionary War. Obadiah had met Rachel while he was boarding at someone's home in Wallingford, and she claimed to have fled from Long Island for fear of the British troops occupying New York. And she presented herself as a most reputable character, but was now reduced to the greatest distress and became obliged to subsist herself by her own labor. To the Though she had heretofore been supported in elegance, and lived delicately. So she represented herself as this sort of wealthy single woman, very, very good catch. So he fell in love with her, uh, married her, but then after the wedding, he discovered she was no other than the infamous Rachel Page of Branford. So a person who had been lately convicted and punished for theft, and she had given birth to an illegitimate child as well, which was also punishable um, legally back then. And as if that wasn't scandalous enough, he discovered the real reason she had fled from Long Island wasn't because of fear of the British, but because she had beat and wounded her own mother in such a horrid manner as obliged her to fly for fear of the resentment of the people. He was granted his divorce. So another thing for people who are investigating the county court records and the superior court records of New Haven, this is really important to know. Um, spelling was not standardized back then. Grammar was not standardized back then. Um, Noah Welps, Webster helped standardize the written language, English language in America, um, but these were not consistent even in legal documents. Court clerks would spell words phonetically or according to their own personal preferences. And this case is particularly intriguing because modern grammar sticklers would consider this an abomination. Um, this is a case from 1792. Um, it was a lawsuit regarding the overworking of a horse, um, and it was summoning, uh, so summoning Samuel S. Russell and Timothy Russell to appear before the courts um, on the fourth Tuesday of November next, then and there, possessive form, to answer unto William Fowler of St. Guilford. <laughs> so I think that's one of my favorite mistakes. 
And finally, this is one of my favorite, all of the finds. Uh, this is from 1760. Um, you have Jacob Robinson of New Haven suing Joseph Tuttle of New Haven for slander, another slander case. These are always very fun. Uh, Joseph Tuttle was quite the popular defendant. Uh, normally, he was just sued for debt. Um, there are at least 26 cases where he was a debtor in this time period. But in this case, he was sued for slander. It was alleged that he called Robinson a very scandalous word. Um, and if you want to know more, I have a link because I don't want to say the word. I don't want to get in trouble for saying the word. But yes, it's a scandalous word in front of several people at Thomas Smith Jr.'s house. And apparently the court clerk was skeptical of Tuttle's innocence because what you see here are doodles on the back of the smaller paper, which was a presentment. Um, the doodles read, whatsoever you think you suddenly speak, quick quid, which is essentially Latin for whatever. Uh, Joseph Tattle, don't you prattle, sweetly smiles. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing such interesting cases with us. And uh, it just shows that research can be exciting and um, it's not boring. You find some really great stories. Um, for for people who are watching this video who want to learn more or who want to use the resources that you've been working with, can you talk a little bit about where folks would go to find them and to access the resources? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So got the, the slide here. I'm going to show you each of these websites. So we have a subject guide and a blog for Uncovering New Haven where we talk in more detail about these about these and other cases we found. Um, our Connecticut State Library research guides, uh, reference services homepage has a great, you know, sort of one-stop shop for all the different subject guides we have on other collections if people are interested in going other uh, directions because we have an extensive collection of primary and secondary sources on a variety of interesting Connecticut history topics. And then I'll just show you a bit of the Connecticut Digital Archive where we've digitized some of our court cases so people can access them right there. So now I'm just want to go to, just want to go to, nope, <laughs> that's not right. Okay, there we go. Right button. All right. So the first one I want to show is the, let me make sure I've got my right. So this is our subject guide. So this is um, all the links that I'm talking about will be provided on the handout. And I will show you people how they can easily access that as well. Um, so this is the home page of our subject guide for Uncovering New Haven. It talks about what we're doing here. Our full terminology policy is listed here. And then a little, some of our search places you can search. Um, and I'll kind of go through the tabs. We have a couple of different um, things that have been grouped together resources. I also want to say uh, we encourage people to vet the resources being listed on here. doesn't necessarily mean an endorsement of the resources. It just means here's some resources. So we encourage people to use their discretion and their discernment. So we have the Black and Indigenous History tab here, and I have a list of books um, a list of books that people can look at and have a lot of books websites, um, the conscientious description I mentioned here for people who are looking for more information about that, slavery and servitude, subjects of interest, articles. We also have uh, lists of names that you might commonly find. Um, also some people, some, pe some people you might wanna keep a lookout for as well as statutes from an old statutes book regarding. So similarly, we have, as well in the women's history, we have books, articles about women's that are focused on women's history, and then colonial and national history. I highly recommend this book. This book, if you want to learn about New Haven Colony and go back further, Judge John C. Blue writes a very fascinating treatise on the case of the Piglet's paternity trials for New Haven. And yes, it is as weird as it sounds <laughs> and interesting as it sounds. Um, so a lot of great books here, a lot of websites, um, a lot of articles, and then a lot of laws, a lot of laws. So we have a lot of stuff. Oh, and lists of first names and surnames. Um, then we have the Connecticut courts. So books, websites, research guides, finding aids to other county court and, su and superior court of other counties that we have processed in the past. Once New Haven is done, that will be here as well. Whoops. And then we have 
a glossary of terms. So there are legal and other relevant terms, including the insults that Joseph Tuttle used are in here. So if people are looking for definitions um, as well as the presentation. So people who are looking for the slides, they're right here as well as our handout. So they are right here. And then as soon as this video posted, it will be right here. It will be right here as well. And then other presentations we've done. And then finally, we come to our blog. So our blog has a bunch of things that we've profiled of cases and other things we've profiled um, about stuff we've found. Um, and these are written not as an end point, but as a starting point for people who want to delve in further. So this is not the last word, but an opening sort of to pique people's interest and to maybe provide people some, you know, a starting point if they want to delve deeper into these subjects. Now, a lot of the cases that I talked about in this presentation, they are talked about in here in the handout for people who want to read more about any of the cases I've discussed. I have put more links. Um, we've also featured things on Instagram as well. So any relevant things in the cases I've talked about, if anyone wants to read more, I've put more information in there. So this is pretty much our little subject guide. You can do you can you can do subjects tags. We have a search like if you're looking for example, I want to know about women, you know, you can see where we featured that. So you can organize them by tags. The next resource I wanted to go over was this is our reference services home. So if you want to browse subject guides, you can browse them by topic, you can select a guide, new subjects, there's all research. If you go to history and genealogy, there's more collections. So we have very, very many. This is like a great spot to if you just want to start and see what resources are out there. And these are all the subject guides that have been put together by various people, wonderful people at the library. So and speaking of which, I come to the History Day Guide. We have a whole guide it's put together by Jenny Groom, and there's lots of pages. So we have a lot of, there's a lot of resources for people who are looking to do History Day, looking to participate, students and teachers. There's a specific page for 2024 so that people can look at those examples of potential topics. Um, and all kinds of all kinds of stuff here. And then we also have a teacher resources page as well. So if teachers are looking and they want, so we have a lot of information packed into here for, for the teachers and the students who wish to participate in History Day or who are just doing research in history. So, and then finally, this is uh, this is our page in the Connecticut uh, the Connecticut uh, Digital Archive, and so this is just summary of what is in here, of where all our court cases are. Um, and then I can kind of walk you through one. So let's go with here. Let's go with here. We'll kind of go in. And so yeah, you can see the summary. Let's pick one from here. And I'll just kind of walk you through what you can kind of find. Let's go very early. Let's go super early. Yes. So. Let's do Barnabas Baldwin versus Cuba Freeman. So if you click on this, you can see, you can actually, you can zoom in. We scan the fronts and backs of documents. You can kind of zoom in to see it. Very high quality TIFF. Um, if you want to view the details about the case, we have other topics now, like if you wanted to, you could click these and be taken to a bunch of records as well that are sorted under tags. Um, and you can bookmark it, you can download it. So basically this is a great way for people to access stuff online um, without having to like come to the library, see the record and handle the brittle paper. So this is, uh, this is one of the ways that we're really trying to make records more accessible. I wish we could scan all the court records, but we have so many we can't, but we're trying to get as many as possible in here. So if you go back to sort of the, you can also, you can, there's also other subject categories that you can, you can also look in this folder and they'll kind of group everything together. So this is, this is where you see the, the court cases where we have scanned and we're adding more and more every day. So I think that's it for the 
resources, unless you had any questions, Rebecca, um, about any of these resources or wanted to see something specific? No, I just want to thank you for sharing this information. And I'm looking forward to sharing it with our teachers and students because um, it, it just what great resources that our state library has. And I think with the kind of onset of digitization, that that's opening it up to so many folks who that way you don't have to drive up to Hartford. You can really go online and still see the actual document, which is really exciting. So I just mm -hmm. want to thank you for your time and for sharing this with everyone. And uh, I hope that all of our students are able to do some really great research uh, with all this knowledge. So thank you very much. So Sarah, I have one last question. While you were um, pulling this together, as you've been looking through the records, have you discovered anything that if you were a History Day student that you might like to do as your turning points in history topic? Oh yeah, the 1700s is in particular a great century of transition. I've written a few things about it in the blog. I did 100 years of tradition. So there are a couple of major transitions that happen. Um, transition from loyalists to patriots. Uh, so I've written a couple of things on that. Transition from the Puritan era mindset in the early 1700s to approaching the industrial age in the late 1700s. Um, transition from British colony to America. So there's a lot of great transitions. There's even some kind of transitions, like for example, the transition of women from competent and capable help meet to more sort of ornamental gent and leisure gentility. So there are some also, so you're not going to see women serving as attorneys in the late 1700s, but you would in the early. So there's some interesting transitions, um, some forward, some not so much. Um, there's also some transitions I've found um, where in some earlier codes in New Haven, um, there were animal cruelty laws, but those disappeared from the law book that I had all those documents from. Those di I did not find any later statutes. So there were animal cruelty statutes, but they seem to have disappeared. Um, oh, interesting. So there's some really interesting kind of cycles uh, as well. Um, another thing people could look at is that there was a time after the revolution where it might have been possible for, you know, women to gain rights as well as there were black freemen who were allowed to vote and own property in Connecticut until the early 1800s when that was taken away. Um, so there are some little things right there um, to look into is the transition also from the revolution um, as well as to the 1830s. There was a transition um, as well. So there was a little bit of a loss of rights for women and people of color um, that were not regained until later in the 1800s, early 1900s. So there, there's always lots of transitions. There's, I can think of another case too, um, the transition to the legal system. Um, I came across a case in the 1760s where the man made an argument based on a technicality of a contract um, and he would not have won that argument if it was still more of a puritanical mindset. His son had, became an apprentice and it is a really interesting case. His son came, became an apprentice um, to, I believe it was a tailor. Um, his son, his name was Nehemiah. He ended up committing fornication and then coming down with a venereal disease. And this made him unable to work. So his father, Mordecai, Mordecai Marx, who was actually, he was actually a Sephardic Jew who converted to Christianity and came to colonies. Um, he argued that he was not bound with, even though his son was a minor and he technically would have been responsible, um, he argued that he was not specifically bound in the contract jointly and separately. <laughs> so he actually won his case because he technically wasn't bound. So he technically wasn't. So it was really interesting because um, 100 years earlier, and I think this case happened in the 1760s, 100 years earlier, the Puritans would have been like, no, we, you're guilty. So you see more of technicalities, more sort of... Um, it's more complex. You definitely needed attorneys um, to help navigate the complexities, the increasing complexities of the legal system. Whereas the Puritans are like, we're going to find the guilt. We're going to root it out. <laughs> <laughs> so in ne and Nehemiah Marx ends up, it's interesting because he does end up living a long and full life. He ends up getting married, fathering eight children and becoming a loyalist and fleeing to Canada. So oh my it's gosh. very colorful. You find a lot of stuff, uh, when you start kind of looking more in depth into the court cases. So, and of course, people are going to come into the court cases. They're going to find their own threads to pursue. I have uh, one of our library staff is really interested in the lists of goods and what they portray about prosperity and trade. 
Um, she actually takes careful looks at the lists of the goods, and she's done some kind of background research um, for her own interest on what, how that indicated that trade was increasing more, the bigger availability of goods. So everybody always has um, sort of their own kind of like view that they're like bringing in. So there's always something to find in that might pique someone's interest. And there's so many different directions you could go. That's really interesting. Um, I I was amazed when you talked about women attorneys. Uh, yes, you know that was amazing to me, and it's it's interesting, kind of that sometimes you progress with rights and sometimes yep. you regress. But and it, yep, we were that was unexpected because we we're like really, and then I did my research, and they're like, yes, absolutely, but it wasn't because it, I think the reason that women lost that is because it wasn't grounded in the fact that women were autonomous being rights. It was grounded in more, you need to be helping your husband and you need to be competent and capable and living um, living where it's more of a settlement, more of a frontier. We can't afford the leisure gentility kind of like, you know, fragile flower. We can't, we can't afford that trope right now. <laughs> so not right. until things are more prosperous, more settled, more affluent, then you start to see the emergence of these sort of the leisured class kind of thing. So. Well, uh, it it sounds amazing. I, what a great opportunity for you to delve into such interesting records. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. We really appreciate it. No, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. And, uh, and one of the things I hope too, is that by sharing, you know, what I've found that other people will be like, oh, hey, I want to delve into this and find stuff too. And, and it's, it's like, we've had like people from like students to like really advanced scholars. So like the great thing is it's like, it's like so many people can delve into it and find out more. And if someone wants to come to the state library, do you recommend the best thing is to call ahead or how? Yes, there's actually, um, so we have a couple places. So in the teacher's guide, they actually have a whole guide of like, if teacher wants to bring students, um, what they can do, definitely call ahead, make appointments. Um, also the fact that I that I am processing this thing processing these in an off-site facility so there are retrievals that are done um, so it's definitely best to plan in advance the state library's website has a whole page about what to do like you know if you need a library card like so there's information on our website as to how best and then also who you can call um, and then to get hours and things like that so definitely best to plan ahead if you need to come um, and look at various resources that don't circulate or that are print-based definitely would be good to call ahead, make appointments, make arrangements. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And thank you for your presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.